The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. This is chapter 7, From Lucas to the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School. Among many other influences, the critical theorists of the Frankfurt School were inspired by the philosophy of Praxis as they discovered it in the early work of Marx and Lucas. Marx's concept of nature and Lucas's theory of reification are fundamental to the thinking of Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse. The distinction between traditional and critical theory flows directly from the revival of dialectics in the work of Lucas, Korch, Bloch, and others writing in the early 1920s. There is a deeper connection than simple influence between the Frankfurt School and the philosophy of praxis. We have seen that Marx and Lucas engage certain themes that hang together in a specific figure of thought. At its core is the metacritique of philosophy, the notion that the typical binary oppositions of the tradition, such as the split between subject and object, fact and value, reason and life, constitute antinomies that depend ultimately on the structure of society and that can be overcome through social change. This turn away from philosophical speculation toward action implies an absolute historicism without which social change would not have ontological significance. Absolute in this context means all-embracing. Nature is thus incorporated into history by one or another conceptual means. All these themes reappear in the Frankfurt School, elaborated in original ways. It is not necessary to assume the direct influence of history in class consciousness, although that can by, that can by no means be excluded. The Frankfurt School develops its characteristic positions in opposition to both Soviet dialectical materialism and Western academic philosophy. In pursuing this project, it simply takes for granted many of the themes explored by Lucas, Bloch, and Korch, themes that are also found in texts of the early Marx the significance of which becomes clear with the publication in 1932 of the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts. In the judgment of the Frankfurt School, Lucas's version of the philosophy of praxis fails in its main project, the offabung of philosophy in an identical subject-object. This judgment is sometimes based on simple misinterpretation. This is especially clear in Adorno's negative dialectics which addresses an obvious straw man, as I argued in the previous chapter. Apart from interpretive failure, there are deeper reasons behind the rejection of Lucas's thought. Lucas shares the ambition of classical German philosophy to construct a universal rationalism, although he intends to reach that goal through social theory rather than through philosophical speculation. This ambition appears excessive and dangerous to the philosophers of the Frankfurt School. The very idea of a universal rationalism seems obviously to overreach the possibilities of finite human understanding, and yet there are risks in accepting the obvious in this case, for the irrational does not simply stay in its cognitive place as the unknown X. It invariably intrudes on practical life under the guise of religion, tradition, racist or nationalist prejudice, even a furor. The Enlightenment attempted to conjure away such threats with a rationalism that degenerates, Horkheimer and Adorno argue, into a totalitarian instrumentalism entwined with other irrational forces it cannot control. Lucas's theory of reification is a first critique of the instrumentalist degeneration Horkheimer and Adorno denounce. His solution is a non-instrumental practice that transforms social meanings from within. A practical version of imminent critique. This practice is supposed to overcome the irrationality of existence, the indifference of form and content. But once it fails, the problem of rationalism reappears in all its tragic glory. The Frankfurt philosophers reject rationalism in the mutilated form in which it has come down to them. They see in Lucas's theory a continuation of the naive productivist attitude toward nature characteristic of both capitalist society and traditional Marxism. 
They put the domination of nature on the Marxist agenda for the first time, radicalizing the Marxist critique of science and technology that begins in Lucas, but that he does not carry through to its logical conclusion. Lucas addresses the problem of social domination, the concrete content that breaks out of the conceptual straitjacket of reification is the laboring human being, not nature. For the Frankfurt School, this is no minor omission. They argue that the central issue of the 20th century is the domination of nature. This realization requires a certain humility. As a natural being, the conqueror of nature is himself among the conquered. Marx promises a completely humanized nature, but that project culminates in the atomic bomb, not utopia. Lucas promises a totality in which objectivity is transparent to the social subject, but the outcome is totalitarianism. Critical theory struggles against these utopian promises. The rejection of Lucas's version of the philosophy of practice is also motivated by the breakdown of the unity of theory and practice that is, the idealized relation of Marxism to the proletariat. Theory and practice can only be united where the crisis tendencies identified by Marxism open a breach in the reified forms, and where the proletariat enters that breach. Lucas believes in this prospect in the early 1920s. He notes that the proletariat is free to reject its own revolutionary potential, but he shares the optimism of the post-World War I revolutionary upsurge. Furthermore, he is confident that the economic laws of capitalism will continually reproduce revolutionary conditions, even if this upsurge fails. The Frankfurt School forms later, at a time when the unity of theory and practice is broken. The revolution is an abstract possibility rather than a real force. So the Frankfurt School philosophers concluded, at first tentatively, and then during and after World War II, more and more unreservedly. With the breakdown of revolutionary expectations, Lucas's rationalism appears as an illusion entertained in an exceptional historical moment. If Lucas failed to anticipate the breakdown of the unity of theory and practice, this is due not only to historical circumstances, but to the rather small place occupied by technology and social psychology in his argument. For obvious reasons, he lacks a media theory. He does not or he does note the reifying consequences of mechanization briefly and mentions the reification of the subjectivity of journalists and other, and other middle-class employees. While conceding that immediate experience is reified for all classes in capitalist society, he considers workers partially exempt due to the mechanical nature of their labor. This is more or less the sum total of his dealings with the factors the Frankfurt School holds responsible for the failure of the revolution. Lucas argues that the imposition of a narrow reified rationality is met by resistance from below. This dialectic institutes another, higher form of rationality. The Frankfurt School, by contrast, focuses on the consequences of the failure of resistance and the regressive forms of irrationality associated with it. The unifying theme of its analysis is the growing power of technology to control the social and natural worlds in an increasingly exploitative pattern signified by the concept of domination. Freudian ideas about repression and character structure, new approaches to authoritarianism, and a radical critique of the psychic impact of regimentation at work, abundance of consumer goods, media propaganda, and so on, explain the effectiveness of the new system. By the time he finally realizes that the revolution is not about to overtake the advanced countries of Europe, but will remain confined to Russia for a long time to come, Lucas reasons about politics in Leninist terms. He can no longer draw on the, on the resources of his earlier work to deal with the new problems emerging in advanced societies. As a result, he does not elaborate an independent theory of the failure of the revolution in the West. Of course, the theory of reification can be deployed for this purpose, and that is precisely what the Frankfurt School does. It is in recognition of this that Adorno calls Lucas's early book important, despite his harsh critique, and elsewhere praises him as the first dialectical materialist to apply the category of reification systematically to philosophy. 
In addressing the role of reification in the failure of the revolution, the Frankfurt School makes a definite advance. The loss of revolutionary prospects has philosophical as well as political implications. According to Lucas's Metacritique, the tension between the reified form of the society and its living human content is not only social, but also appears in classical German philosophy as a fundamental and unsurpassable irrationality, signified by the concept of the thing in itself. Lucas's resolution of this tension depends on the unity of theory and practice. To the extent that the Frankfurt School accepts Lucas's metacritique, its rejection of his solution reverberates through every level of its approach, from political theory to ontology. The decisive turning point for the Frankfurt School comes with Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment. In that book, they concede the collapse of socialist hopes, the total reification of consciousness, which Lucas had attributed to the bourgeoisie in the middle strata, now extends to the working class as well. Instrumental reason erodes everyday experience and replaces a rich and complex relation to reality with simple manipulation. No meaningful world is possible anymore. The principle of life that in Lucas undermined the reified forms has been cancelled in a mechanistic universe. The redemptive promise of rationality no longer lies in the socialist future, but is reconstructed around the role of reflection in recognizing the limits of human technical powers over both inner and outer nature. Nature now stands in for the life process Lucas identified with the proletariat. However, this nature is not a positive force, but names what is repressed by technological domination. It is the object of a reflective retrieval aimed at bounding technology and the competitive forces that deploy it in order to allow other dimensions of existence to flourish. Respect for these other dimensions is tied up with compassion, solidarity, and happiness. In Dialectic of Enlightenment and Adorno's later writings, this critique of instrumentalism does not quite culminate in a positive concept of rationality capable of replacing the reified one. Negative dialectics is not such a concept. It does not resolve the antinomies, but rather identifies them as such and suspends all premature resolutions. It is the logic of imminent critique and not a constructive alternative. For the alternative implied by the critique to emerge, a social change would be required that Adorno neither describes nor predicts. But Adorno hints tantalizingly at more than this. A society reconciled with nature would be a utopia, albeit an unusual one. This utopia is not an alternative, rational plan of existence, but can only be indicated negatively as not this or that contemporary horror. As Adorno writes, the true thing determines itself via the false thing. Marcuse's one-dimensional man continues this argument while attempting to construct a positive notion of dialectical rationality. The modern differentiation of imagination from instrumental rationality denies the potentialities of people and things. Those potentialities can be grasped imaginatively and incorporated into a new concept of reason. Marcuse draws on Marx's manuscripts for the idea of lived nature a Marxist version of the phenom phenomenological Lebenswelt, which he contrasts with the stripped-down, quantified nature of science and technology. Following the early Marx, Marcuse ontolog ontologizes the human relation to this lived nature. Reality is not the indifferent object of an abstract cognitive subject, but confronts the human subject as a subject in its own right. The distance between this version of the Frankfurt School approach and the early Marx and Lucas is not so great. In place of Adorno's negative utopia, Marcuse attempts to specify the broad outlines of a future alternative. The idea of potentiality is developed in Hegelian terms as the determinate negation of the capitalist system. It remains fairly abstract at first, but acquires content through the struggles of the new left. Nature now appears not just negatively as the repressed,
but concretely as the natural environment and in expressions of the human needs for peace, beauty, meaning, and love. At this point, Marcuse's theory shows itself to be an original version of the philosophy of praxis. Through a long detour, the Frankfurt School returns to its sources. In this chapter and the next, I will trace these developments, weaving back and forth between the negative dialectics of Adorno and Marcuse's two-dimensional ontology. This chapter will begin by considering some implications of the concept of nature and rationality in Horkheimer and Adorno, and conclude with considerations on the political impasse they reach. Chapter 8 then shows how phenom phenomenological themes in Marcuse's theory of experience led him to a far more positive evaluation of utopian prospects. In conclusion, I will show how the idea of the liberation of nature figures in the philosophy of praxis of the Frankfurt School. Along the way, I will develop several themes from my own critical theory of technology that address deficiencies in the original Frankfurt School approach. Forms of rationality. The path from Marxist theories of commodity fetishism and alienation through Lucas's theory of reification to the Frankfurt School's critique of domination is a winding one, but it must be followed to understand the fate of the philosophy of praxis. Marxist theories of commodity, fetishism, and alienation depend on each other in important ways. They intersect in the concept of wage labor, the transformation of work into a market good. This transformation awaits the generalization of commodity exchange that is sharply restricted in pre-capitalist societies to exclude most land and labor. The wage system sets in motion the process leading to the de-skilling and mechanization of labor. Through that process, capitalism develops a technology uniquely suited to its requirements. That technology reduces the worker to an appendage of the machine. I have shown earlier that Lucas's meta-critique of reified rationality invokes both components of Marx's theory. He argues that the commodity form is the model of all forms of subjectivity and objectivity in capitalist society, and also claims that the retaliation of the worker to the machine realizes, or sorry, that the relation of the worker to the machine realizes that form and the technical subject-object relation. Accordingly, reified rationality has two aspects, the quantitative or formal laws under which things are grasped, and the reduction of the subject of action to a manipulator of things in accordance with those laws. Each aspect derives from one or the other component of Marx's theory, abstraction from commodity fetishism and technical subjectivity from alienation. Lucas's meta-critique of reified rationality grounds a dialectical alternative. Under the influence of Hegel, Marx, and Lucas, the philosophers of the Frankfurt School develop a similar conception of dialectics. However, their emphasis is different. Marx and Lucas were primarily interested in the domination of human beings by the capitalist system, but neither realized that insofar as the dominated human being is reduced to a natural object, all of nature is implicated in the social critique. This is the chiasmus through which the Frankfurt School transforms Marxism into a critique of the domination of nature. Its reformulation of Marxism thus goes beyond the critique of capitalism to take in the very concept of progress, understood as the conquest of nature. There are some subtle and some not so subtle differences in the formulations of this theme in the Frankfurt School. This is not an obstacle to broad brush treatments, but it makes for difficulties in characterizing its position with precision. To begin, here is a sketch of some of the commonalities based primarily on Horkheimer's early book, Eclipse of Reason. Horkheimer's metacritique of rationality resembles Weber's distinction between formal and, and substantive rationality. Reason is not pure, but is always socially embedded in one of two ways. Substantive rash, rationality, which Horkheimer calls objective reason, incorporates a goal in its structure. It is not merely a means, but also includes an objectively valid end. At the origin, that end is simple, self-preservation. Later, religion and culture supply pre-modern societies with a variety of such ends, but their claims are no longer convincing. In modern society, rational means are value-free, 
All that remains to guide their application is the, is the struggle for existence, which eliminates all restraint on competition and on the exploitation of nature. And since human beings are natural beings, they too fall victim to their own technology. Horkheimer introduces the concept of subjective reason to describe the instrumental rationality of a system of pure means without a substantive end beyond the increase in its own power and range. Modernity is characterized by the complete triumph of subjective rationality and the consequent catastrophe of enlightenment, the disappointed hope in reason. The conflicts of human beings and societies pursuing their individual and national self-preservation with the tools of modern technology now threaten their survival as much as raw nature ever did. Furthermore, technical progress goes along with increasing psychological repression. Control of inner nature is the condition of effective control of, our na of outer nature. Under the conditions of class society, both forms of control overshoot their mark, producing individual and social pathologies. In Dialectic of Enlightenment, Horkheimer and Adorno protest the untrammeled pursuit of technical power, which they regard as the irrational core of rationalism. In class history, the enmity of the self to sacrifice implied a sacrifice of the self, inasmuch as it was paid for by a denial of nature and man for the sake of domination over non-human nature and over other men. This very denial, the nucleus of all civilizing rationality, is the germ cell of a proliferating mythic irrationality. With the denial of nature in man, not merely the telos of outward control of nature, but the telos of man's own life is distorted and befogged. As soon as man discards his awareness that he himself is nature, all the aims for which he keeps himself alive, social progress, the intensification of all his material and spiritual powers, even consciousness itself, are nullified. And the enthronement of the means as an end, which under late capitalism is tantamount to open insanity, is already perceptible in the prehistory of subjectivity. Horkheimer argues that only a generalization of the will to self-preservation can save humanity from self-destruction. This requires a reflective recovery of the original meaning and purpose of rationality. Reason is not truly value-free, but has always included a reference to self-preservation that it can now achieve only as a human goal. Control of the natural world must be guided by respect for human nature and greater reliance on the intrinsically life-affirming aspects of natural growth. Dialectic of Enlightenment develops this argument. The solution the authors propose is obscurely hinted at in scattered passages throughout the book. In one such passage, they remark, By virtue of this mindfulness of nature in the subject, in whose fulfillment the acknowledged truth of all culture lies hidden, enlightenment is universally opposed to domination. And they go on to suggest that domination can only be dissolved when it is recognized as unreconciled nature. This unreconciled nature cannot be conquered and absorbed, but must be accepted through a process of reflection. It is such reflective acceptance that really challenges power. Dominant practice and its inescapable alternatives are not threatened by nature, which tends rather to coincide with them, but by the fact that nature is remembered. Participation in Nature These ideas lie in the background of Adorno's later work. There, his critique of society unfolds with a slightly different emphasis than Horkheimer's and Marcuse's. The difference corresponds to the emphasis placed on each of the two sources of the notion of reification in Marx. Adorno draws primarily on the theory of commodity fetishism. What most impresses him is the notion that abstract quantity replaces quality as immediate appearance throughout society. He generalizes this notion as Lucas had proposed as the universal model of all forms of objectivity and subjectivity. But unlike Lucas, Adorno presents this thesis Pro, uh, programmatically as a critique of rational conceptualization. His term for, this, for his approach is non-identity of concept and object. This suggests an irrationalist hostility to concepts, but Adorno is not an irrationalist. A Marxist account of knowledge must begin with the fact that experience is a socially mediated relation to real objects. 
Adorno's emphasis on mediation responds to the suspicion that experience has been reified by capitalism. This is one way of interpreting commodity fetishism. We no longer relate immediately to the reality, the use value of the object, but to an abstraction projected in the market. What Adorno calls identifying thought Im imagines that it has understood what it names in classifying it. In this respect, it resembles commodity fetishism that reduces objects to a narrow and abstract meaning, i.e. price. Classification is unable to penetrate the veil of reification since it ignores the history and connections of the things classified. Overcoming immediacy is a necessary theoretical task beyond the scope of mere classification. Lucas explains reification in terms of the form of objectivity through which he distinguishes between the rational form and lived content of experience. Although he does not employ Lucas's terminology, Adorno's concept of identifying thought and its material consequences in the domination of human beings and nature also describes the formal structure of reification in tension with its content. Recovering reality therefore requires recognition of that content, the priority of the object relative to identifying thought. The non-identity of concept and object is the difference between that aspect of the particular that can be completely subsumed under a universal and other aspects that escape simple subsumption. True understanding is not based on classifying what immediately appears, but respects the intrinsic complexity of its objects. That requires many different conceptual probes that mediate the multiple aspects of the phenomena. Adorno writes, by gathering around the object of cognition, the concepts potentially determine the object's interior. They attain in thinking what was necessarily excised from thinking. Adorno calls this procedure the construction of a constellation. This aspect of Adorno's theory is roughly similar to the Hegelian concept of the concrete, as discussed in chapter four. Objects are not isolated and self-contained. They are functional components in the social totality. Their truth is revealed in assemblages of concepts that articulate their various connections with other objects. These assemblages reveal the object's contingency, lack of unity, contradictory nature. They expose its potentialities as well as its history and thereby achieve a rational identity that adequately represents the object as a mediated whole. The conceptual mediations articulate real mediations constitutive of the object and driving its development. In this sense, the constellation transcends the givenness of the thing. However, Adorno also asserts the transcendence of the thing as material with respect to its concept. What does this puzzling insistence on the material reality of the object really mean? Adorno surely does not intend to remind us of this simple fact, that things are not thoughts. This is a trivial point Dr. Johnson settled long ago. But he does insist that thoughts are not things in the sense that there is always more to reality than is reflected in our comprehension of it. Every universal concept, indeed every Indeed, even every constellation of such concepts is incomplete. This ultimate non-identity is not trivial since it signals the methodological requirements of openness and revisability of knowledge. However, Adorno goes further than this. It is not just that things are infinitely complex, but, but that the relatively un or indeterminate character of reality is open to us through our bodily contact with it. This is the properly materialist dimension of non-identity. Subjects are not abstract cogitos, but embodied persons to whom things are present physically and not just conceptually. Adorno thus finds himself in agreement with those passages in Marx's manuscripts that emphasize the sensuous material reality of both subject and object in opposition to Hegelian idealism. As Marx says, we are real, natural entities, and only as such can we have real entities as our objects. Experience is most fundamentally an encounter, not a conscience consciousness. Adorno conceives materiality as a preconceptual fact. While this sounds a bit like phenomenology, Adorno rejects both Husserl's concept of consciousness 
and Heidegger's ontologized version of it as being in the world. He argues that phenomenology is a positivism of the immediate facts of consciousness. His concept of experience includes aspects slighted in one way or another by phenomenology, such as the distortion of immediacy by commodity fetishism and the potentialities of things revealed in their constellations. Adorno's critique is justified to the extent that phenomenology has no account of these aspects of experience. Having rejected phenomenology, Adorno does not propose some sort of causal account of perception a la Locke. The somatic basis of perception is not reducible to naturalistic physiology. In all such accounts, the meaningless object which Adorno charges is actually an abstract positive thought somehow produces an effect of meaning in the subject. Rather, one must start from the actual experience that is a complex of so-called secondary qualities, meanings, and values, along with direct physical interaction with the world. The experiential encounter with the concrete is not reducible to knowledge of objective facts, but is qualitative and value-laden. Adorno claims that all this is real, not a subjective illusion or mental projection. The contribution of the subject to experience is not a source of error, but an essential cons or constituent. Through it alone, the objects of experience take on meaning. In interpreting the meaning of the object in these terms, the constellation tells us about the reality and not about ourselves. But this interpretation of non-identity pushes the problem back a step. For now, to make sense of his claim that we are material things interacting with other material things, we must understand what Adorno means by a material thing. Unfortunately, this aspect of his theory is underdeveloped. Scholars have suggested a variety of interpretations of his implicit ontology. For example, Brian O'Connor argues that despite significant differences, Adorno's theory has much in common with phenomenology, while J.M. Bernstein relates it to the concept of material inference. But whatever their interpretation, the commentators reaffirm the basic structure of philosophy of praxis. A deeper unity of subject and object underlies the historically evolved split due to the reifying dynamics of capitalism and exemplified by the philosophical tradition. A thinking that restores those suppressed dimensions can also claim to be rational in a different sense from instrumentalism. Instrumental rationality arises through abstraction and reduction of this richer, original experience. Its objects come to it with a history and with connections to other objects that it strips away to arrive at a quantitative manipulat manipulable remainder. Adorno's anthropomorphic concept of experience prescinds from the effective disenchantment of the world by modern scientific technical thinking. However, here the story gets complicated. Although the truth of sensation is the mutual mediation and, in, and interdependence of subject and object, as revealed in the unreduced experience, this truth is ever less accessible in modern society. The prevailing instrumentalism is not merely theoretical, but affects experience itself. The diminished experience available in this society constitutes a particularly pernicious real abstraction, one that endangers rationality itself by reducing it to its purely instrumental aspect. From this reduction spring the various antinomies of philosophy, the split between subject and object, value and fact, and so on. The unity, if not identity, of subject and object and experience is blocked by a social phenomenon, the disenchantment process, and can thus only be recovered through social change. The pattern established in this analysis of experience is the familiar one of philosophy of praxis. Desublimation of the philosophical categories, transposition of the relations in idealist philosophy to their desublimated surrogates, and resolution of the antinomies in history. Adorno's critique of the overextension of instrumental rationality appears similar to Habermas's colonization thesis. Like the colonization thesis, this argument depends on a notion of appropriate balance between different world relations lost in the course of capitalist development. But Adorno anticipates Habermas's formulation and rejects it in advance. 
In On Subject and Object, he criticizes as shameful the concept of communication as imparting information between subjects because it betrays what is best, the potential for agreement between human beings and things. This is a peculiar phrase. In what sense can human beings and things agree? Adorno goes on to explain that peace is the state of differentiation without domination, with the differentiated participating in each other. These passages occur in a speculative ellipsis Adorno allows himself exceptionally. He quickly moves on to other subjects without explaining properly what he means. When scattered passages throughout his work are compared, certain ideas come through that help to interpret his intent. Nature and history are not independent of each other, but must be understood in their inseparable connection. In modern societies, a historically sedimented second nature of dead conventions and institutions occupies the place of mythic fate that unmastered nature once signified for primitive peoples. Natural beauty, especially where human artifacts have been harmoniously integrated into it, prefigures a redemptive future in which the wounds of nature will heal and life will flourish in peace, i.e. mutual participation of differentiated human and natural being. Nature, in one of Adorno's interpretations, thus holds a utopian promise. That promise is the deepest connection between the Frankfurt School and the philosophy of praxis. What is this harmonious relation to nature if not the transcendence of the antinomy of subject and object in which that philosophy culminates? The connection to the early Marx is obvious. It is true that at points the manuscripts affirm the unlimited transformative power of labor, yet there are other passages in Marx's text that emphasize less the humanization of nature by man than the participation of man in nature. The notion of participatory identity makes room for the sheer naturalness of nature in a way the theory of the humanization of nature through labor does not. In claiming that human needs are correlated with their objects ontologically, Marx asserts an ultimate harmony joining the human being as a natural being with the nature in which its human nature is fulfilled. Nature is not merely the object of the subject because the subject is itself a natural object. The, cons the consubstantiality, con consubstantiality of subject and object supersedes the contingent relation between them assumed by modern philosophy since Descartes. The existing scientific technical rationality based on the most extreme separation of subject and object is condemned as an alienated expression of rationality. Human beings participate in the world in other ways that are less reductive and more firmly based in concrete experience. But for Adorno, the participation of the differentiated is not identity. He explains that it would be impossible to conceive that state as either undifferentiated unity of subject and object or their hostile antithesis. Rather, it would be communication of what is differentiated. But Adorno holds back at the decisive moment. He famously argued that the world is properly understood in the light of redemption, but that ultimate prospect serves only to devalue the given. Redemption does not actually enter history as he conceives it. The Rational Critique of Rationality the Frankfurt School argues that rationality is entangled in a paradox. Its progress leads not to freedom, but to domination. Science, democracy, and prosperity were all made possible by rational critique of the myths and ideologies that supported the Ancien Régime. This is what Habermas calls the Enlightenment Project. It promises that domination will recede as rationality advances. The failure of this happy prospect has led to two different critiques of the Enlightenment. On the one hand, romantic critique calls for a retreat from rationality in all its works. On the other hand, the Frankfurt School proposes a rational critique of reason. These two styles of critique imply different politics, and it is therefore important to distinguish them clearly. The romantic critique of reason begins in the late 18th century, accompanied by an idealization of the past. In literature, the critique opposes passion to bourgeois calculation and social conformism. The familiar image of life versus mechanism, 
captures the essence of the romantic critique. Modernity is often rejected in the name of traditional values. This critique appears to be verified by the 20th century catastrophes of reason. Wars, concentration camps, nuclear weapons, and now environmental crisis threaten the Enlightenment project, not from without, but from within. But it is difficult to believe that the full content and significance of rationality is exhausted by its role in these disasters. The romantic critique is right to challenge a rationalism that blindly submits everything to markets and technology, but it goes too far when it rejects reason as such. Surely reason has self-critical and self-corrective potentials. This is the argument of the Frankfurt School's critique of rationality. The Frankfurt School hopes to construct a coherent basis for a critical theory of modernity out of the flawed inheritance of the Enlightenment. The Frankfurt School's method was anticipated by Marx's economic critique of capitalism. Capitalism claims to be a rational economic system. The market appears rational, but strangely, trading goods for money leads to inequality. This inequality escapes enlightenment critique because it is not justified by narrative myths, as was feudalism, but by the exchange of equivalents, wages for labor. The French anarchist Proudhon famously claimed that property is theft. He treated the market as a fraud rather than as a coherent system. This is the economic equivalent of romantic critique in literature. Marx was, Marx was a more rigorous thinker. He realized that a system as complex and successful as capitalism could not be based on mere fraud. The origin of inequality would have to be found in the very rationality of the market. The equal exchange of wages for labor disguises the role of the length of the working day in determining the rate of exploitation. The deeper problem is not the unfairness of the system, but the larger consequences of capitalist management of the economy, such as the diskilling of work and economic crises. With this argument, Marx showed that rational systems can be oppressive, and he extended this type of critique to technology as well. Although that aspect of his thought lay dormant until Lucas and the Frankfurt School revived it. The, 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 the methodological significance of Marx's analysis lies in combining the apparently co contrary notions of rationality and bias. This is precisely what the Frankfurt School does much later in its critique of the technological consequences of enlightenment. The point of that critique is not to blame technology for social ills, as does romantic critique, nor to appeal to technological rationality as an antidote to the inefficiency of capitalism, as does traditional Marxism, but to show how technology has been adapted in its very structure to an oppressive system. In Dialectic of, en of Enlightenment, this approach is expressed in a passage in which the authors described the ambivalence of the machine as both representative of humanity as a whole and an instrument of domination. The thing-like quality of the means, which makes the means universally available, its objective validity for everyone, itself implies a criticism of the domination from which thought has arisen as its means. On the way from mythology to logistics, thought has lost the element of reflection on itself, and machinery mutilates people today, even if it also feeds them. In the form of machines, however, alienated reason is moving toward a society which reconciles thought in its solidification as an, as an apparatus, both material and intellectual, with a liberating living element, and relates it to society itself as, as its true subject. Today, with the transformation of the world into industry, the perspective of the universal, the social realization of thought, is so fully open to view that thought is repudiated by the rulers themselves as mere ideology. The alienated reason embodied in machines is an objective reality and as such refers to a universal subject and not simply to its owners. The very objectivity of the machine implies that it should be controlled by all in the interests of all. This would be the universal, the social realization of thought, which is obstructed by the existing capitalist society. The availability of the apparatus for this purpose is now so obvious to the simplest reflection that the rulers must reject thought itself to maintain their power. 
The critical standard in terms of which rational achievements are measured is not extrinsic, as in romantic critique, but is contained in the implicit telos of rationality itself. Rationality supplies its own standard of self-critique. In sum, the universal character of rational achievements promises universal benefits, but the promise is betrayed as the technical realization of rationality is, bi is biased toward domination. Adorno makes a similar argument with respect to the market. Equal exchange promises a fairness bellied by the actual realization of the market under capitalism. This is the paradox of rationality. Economic and technological progress have gone hand in hand with the progress of domination. To understand the paradox without romantic subtexts, we need a concept of social bias appropriate for the analysis of rational systems. The Frankfurt School intended just such an analysis, but developed only the rudiments of a method for performing it. This is why its style of critique is often confounded with romantic anti-modernism. The difficulty lies in the departure from the usual concept of bias that is closely associated with prejudice. But bias in a less familiar sense appears in other spheres as well. For example, because right-handedness is prevalent, Many everyday objects are adapted to right-handed use. This too could be called a bias, but it does not involve prejudice. Rather, it is built into the design of the objects themselves. In this, it resembles the kind of bias exhibited by technology and other rational systems under capitalism. The issue can be clarified by distinguishing what I call substantive bias from formal bias. Enlightenment critique addresses the more familiar substantive bias. 18th century philosophers were confronted with institutions that claimed to legitimacy on the basis of stories about the past and religion. The Enlightenment um, judged according to the facts and arguments, and this was fatal to the Ancien Régime. Later, a similar critique attacked race and gender bias, again in the name of, of rational ethical principles, and scientific knowledge of human nature. I call the bias criticized in such cases substantive because it is based on pseudofacts and emotions, specific contents that motivate discrimination. But as the Frankfurt School argues, technology and markets also discriminate in modern rational institutions. Prejudice is not involved. A biased technology is still rational in the sense that it links cause and effect efficiently. It appears value neutral, since it is not an expression of belief and emotion. Indeed, it is often innocent, as, is, as in the case of right-handed tools. Nevertheless, some cases are far from innocent. These are cases involving the asymmetrical, asymmetrical distribution of power through technical or economic arrangements. For example, <clears throat> for example, when the division of labor is technologically structured in such a manner as to doom subordinates to mechanical and repetitive tasks with no role in managing the larger framework of their work, their subordination is technologically embedded. Inequality is enforced by the very rationality of the machine. This sort of bias is properly called formal because it does not violate formal norms such as control and efficiency under which technology is developed and employed. Formal bias can arise from the relation of technologies to their context and it can also enter into the design of devices. Thus Adorno writes, it is not technology which is calamitous but its entanglement with societal conditions in which it is fettered. Considerations of the interests of profit and dominance have channeled technical development. By now it coincides fatally with the needs of control. Not by accident has the invention of means of destruction become the prototype of the new quality of technology. By contrast, those of its potentials which diverge from dominance, centralism, and violence against nature, and which might well allow much of the damage done literally and figurative, figuratively by technology to be healed, have withered. As technologies develop, their social background is forgotten. 
covered over by a kind of unconsciousness that makes it seem as though the chosen faith of progress was inevitable and necessary all along. This is what gives rise to the illusion of pure rationality. That illusion obscures the imagination of future alternatives by granting existing technology and rationalized social arrangements an appearance of necessity they cannot legitimately claim. Critical theory demystifies this appearance to open up the future. It is neither utopian nor dystopian, but situates rationality within the political where its consequences are a challenge to human responsibility. But what if the masses fail to accept the responsibility the theory thrusts upon them? Critical theory establishes the possibility in principle, indeed the urgent necessity of a social transformation it regards as extremely unlikely. Theory and practice. The Frankfurt School recapitulates many of the themes of philosophy of praxis. Marx's Metacritique re reconstructed the concept of need and the forms of rationality, overcoming their antin antinomial opposition in traditional philosophy. The Frankfurt School's Metacritique of Value-Free Technological Rationality achieves a similar result. Reason is once again tied essentially to need, the need for self-preservation. Lucas's theory of reification is a direct and acknowledged influence. The Lucasian dialectic of form and content and its consequences in the antinomies of philosophy has its parallel in the Frankfurt School's critique of the cultural effects of commodity fetishism. And like Marx and Lucas, the Frankfurt School argues that capitalism contains the, the potentiality for a socialist society that would transcend alienation and reification. But there is a characteristic difference in emphasis that distinguishes Adorno's philosophy, especially from philosophy of praxis. In Marx and Lucas, potentialities are manifest in social struggle and realized through the imminent transformative effects of proletarian consciousness and action. In the absence of such historical manifestations of real potentiality, Adorno explains it as an objective striving in things themselves toward their own perfected forms. The damaged life of modern capitalist society, not only in persons but also in nature, aspires more or less unconsciously to a full and flourishing life possible only under socialism. Once it no longer appears in the struggles of the dominated, this aspiration risks tipping over into outright re-enchantment of the disenchanted world of modernity. To avoid this facile outcome, Adorno argues that potentialities are revealed negatively in the structure of damaged life through imminent critique and art. Potentialities are no longer manifested in the experience of a revolutionary class, but depend now on the critical consciousness of the intellectual or artist. Adorno, of course, wishes that critical consciousness were more widely shared, but he does not but he does not expect this to happen anytime soon, and certainly does not attribute it to an active historical subject. The conditions of Lucas's principle of practice are no longer fulfilled. The realization of philosophy is no longer a historical task. In a late lecture, Adorno says, what is at stake is that, given that philosophy is fated with the challenge of transcending itself, if I can put it in this somewhat portentous way, this task should not simply be reflected on, but should really be carried out rigorously through the medium of thought. Note, thought, not practice, as in Marx and Lucas. Does this represent a regression to the sort of moralizing critique Hegel and Marx overcame with the historical concept of potentiality? Brecht ridiculed the last critics in his Tui Roman and Lucas admonished Adorno for abandoning history for the Grand Hotel Abyss. The Frankfurt School philosophers would deny that charge. Their critical standpoint is historically justified by the quasi-dystopian or the quasi-dystopia of rational domination that emerges from the failure of the revolution. But this conclusion threatens the structure of an, of an argument developed from the premises of the philosophy of praxis. Before their final renunciation of the revolution, Horkheimer and Adorno searched hopelessly for a solution. In 1956, they engaged in a dialogue on the theme of a new manifesto. 
This dialogue is easily dismissed as an aberration among their works, but it is symptomatic of a fundamental problem. The dialogue presupposes the logic of Lucas's inter interpretation of the theory-practice relation. Here, one can see how Horkheimer and Adorno hang in suspense on the results of the philosophy of praxis in which they no longer quite believe. Their dialogue reveals the consequences of the breakdown of the third moment of the philosophy of praxis, the historical resolution of the antinomies. That, that breakdown blocks the production of the manifesto and determines the peculiar tone of the dialogue. The pretension to update the Communist Manifesto, written by Marx and Engels in 1847, is astonishing, particularly given the silliness of much of the talk. For example, what are we to make of the first exchanges on the misplaced love of work, which then devolve into a con conversation about the anal sounds emitted by a worker's motorcycle? The dialogue returns constantly to the question of what to say in a time when nothing can be done. The communist movement is dead, killed off by its own grotesque success in Russia and China. Western societies are better than the communist alternatives that nevertheless symbolically represent an emancipated future. Horkheimer is convinced that the world is mad and that even Adorno's modest hope that things might work out someday stinks of theology. Horkheimer mocks his friend. Teddy wants to rescue a pair of concepts, theory and practice. These concepts are themselves obsolete. Instead, he remarks, we probably have to start from the position of saying to ourselves that even if the party no longer exists, the fact that we are here still has a certain value. In sum, the only evidence that something better is possible is the fact that they are sitting there talking about the possibility of something better. In this situation, Horkheimer asks, in whose interests do we write? People might say that our views are just all talk, our own perceptions. To whom shall we say these things? He continues, we have to actualize the loss of the party by saying, in effect, that we are just as bad off as before, but that we are playing in the instrument the way it has to be played today. And Adorno replies cogently and rather comically, there is something seductive about the idea, but what is the instrument? Although Adorno remarks tentatively at one point that he has the feeling that what we are doing is not without its effect, Horkheimer is more skeptical. He says, my instinct is to say nothing if there is nothing I can do. And he goes on to discuss the tone and content of the manifesto in such a way as to reduce it to absurdity. We want the preservation for the future of everything that has been achieved in America today, such as the, re such as the reliability of the legal systems, the drugstores, etc. Oh, this must be made quite clear whenever we speak about such matters. Ow. Adorno replies, that includes getting rid of TV programs when they are rubbish. Contradicting himself, Horkheimer concludes the recorded discussion with the grim words, because we are still permitted to live, we are under an obligation to do something. My description of Horkheimer and Adorno's dialogue may seem unfair. Do they deserve mockery? Yes and no, to quote Har Horkheimer. In one sense, their dialogue is already self-mocking. Horkheimer claims that the tone in which the manifesto is written must somehow overcome its futility in the present period, when it can have no practical effect. Something similar takes place in the dialogue. The light-hearted tone reveals the contradiction between the existential situation of the speakers and their project. What is most peculiar about this exchange is the refusal of these two philosophers to derive a critical standard from philosophical reflection once history can no longer supply it. This is what Habermas would do later, admit the breakdown of Hegelian Marxist historic historicism and substitute a transcendental critique. If no next step lights the way, perhaps ethics can do the job in its place. But Horkheimer and Adorno insist on the importance of situating their thought historically both in terms of their own position and the absence of a party in a movement. 
As Horkheimer notes, we have to think of our own form of existence as the measure as the measure of what we think. But how can critique negate the given society when that society is the critic's sole existential support? The critic is the highest cultural product of the society. In the absence of any realistic alternative, his capacity to negate the society justifies it. He can neither escape from history into the transcendental, as Habermas would have it, nor can he rest his historical case in the progressive movement of history. No wonder the dialogue wavers between the comic and the portentous. How did the Frankfurt School end up in such a bind? The answer to this question leads back to Marx and Lucas. History and class consciousness contains the most influential reflection on the relation of theory and practice in the Marxist tradition. Lucas renewed the Hegelian Marxist historicist critique of abstract ideals that underlies the dilemma at the heart of the dialogue. This argument was known to Horkheimer and Adorno, and its impact on their reflections in the manifesto discussion is obvious. As we saw in chapter 2, Lucas introduces the problem of theory and practice. Through a critique of an early text in which Marx demands that theory seize the masses. Instead, philosophy must proceed from the living contradiction of ideal and real. The philosopher must explain to the world its own acts, showing that actual struggles contain a transcending content that can be linked to the concept of rational social life. The critic, Marx concludes, therefore can start with any form of theoretical and practical consciousness and develop the true actuality out of the forms inherent in existing actuality as its ought to be and goal. Lucas elaborates these Marxian ideas in a critique of Kantian ethical idealism echoed in Horkheimer's statement that reality should be measured against criteria whose capacity for, fu for fulfillment can be demonstrated in a number of already existing concrete developments in historical reality. As Marx writes, it is not enough that thought should seek to realize itself. Reality must also strive toward thought. Theory must be tied to practice, to real historical forces. But, Adorno argues, Marx did not live in a world in which utopia is blocked by the very working class he had charged with realizing it. Now that the revolution has failed, there appears to be no way out of the trap set by the tension between norm and history. Under these conditions, the speculative temptation beckons, but the pressure to satisfy the Hegelian Marxist historicist criterion blocks the further progress of thought. It is impossible to return to what Marx once called the roasted pigeons of absolute science, that is, to some sort of utopian or transcendental thinking. Horkheimer poses the dilemma in two contradictory propositions, saying, on the one hand, our thoughts are no longer a function of the proletariat, and on the other, that theory is theory in the authentic sense, only where it serves practice. Theory that wishes to be sufficient unto itself is bad theory. He concludes that the idea of practice must shine through in everything we write, without any compromise or concession to the actual historical situation, a seemingly impossible demand. This yields what he calls a curious waiting process which Adorno defines as, in the best case, theory as a message in a bottle. Marx and Lucas established the methodological horizon of Marx's politics for the Frankfurt School. Horkheimer and Adorno discuss their manifesto under the horizon. They accept the critique of pure theory and ethical idealism. But now that the proletariat no longer supports a transcending critique of society, any concession to practice drags theory back into the realm of everyday political wheeling and dealing or worse yet, into complicity with the murder of millions by totalitarian communist regimes. As Horkheimer remarks, what is the meaning of practice if there is no longer a party? In that case, doesn't practice mean either reformism or quietism? The possibility of an alternative. Is there no alternative within the Marxist framework? In fact, there is an excluded alternative occasionally evoked in the course of the dialogue. This alternative is Marcuse, who hovers like Banquo's ghost over the conversation. Adorno comes closest to articulating this position and is pulled back by Horkheimer each time. At one point he remarks, 
I cannot imagine a world intensified to the point of insanity without objective oppositional forces being unleashed. This will turn out to be the thesis Mark Hughes hints at in one in one dimensional man and it develops in an, in an essay on liberation. But Horkheimer rejects this view as overly optimistic. A bit later, Adorno refuses to accept that human nature is inherently evil. People only become Khrushchevs because they keep getting hit over the head. But again, Horkheimer rejects the hope of a less repressive future and even ridicules Marcuse, claiming that he expects a Russian Bonaparte to save the day. Finally, there is a passage in which Adorno seems to be seeking an appropriate style for the manifesto. He says, you have to find the point that wounds, offending against sexual taboos. And Horkheimer immediately calls him to order. Marcuse, take care. What are we to make of this ghostly presence of a Marcusean alternative? It seems to me that these remarks already anticipate and condemn Marcuse's openness to the return of history with the new left. Where Horkheimer and Adorno ultimately rejected the new left, Marcuse took the Hegelian, Marxian, Lucisian plunge back into history. He was well aware that the new left was no equivalent of Marxist proletariat, but he tried to find in it a hint of those objective oppositional forces of which Adorno spoke in 1956. Marcuse's important innovation was to recognize the prefigurative force of the new left without identifying it as a new agent of revolution. In this way, theory might be related once again to practice without concession to the existing society, although also with no certainty of success. This formulation still reflects the duality of theory and practice that Lucas resolved in the revolution. But no such resolution is possible for the Frankfurt School. Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse all agree that philosophy and art conserve the transcending content of experience. This content also comes to the surface periodically in social struggles that attempt to realize it in reality. The two sources of transcending content remain separate, independent of each other, and yet they can and do communicate on occasion. The later argument between Adorno and Marcuse was over whether such communication had taken place in the new left. Adorno's position is explained at length in a 1969 essay entitled Marginalia to Theory and Practice. Amid much interesting discussion of the nature of theory and practice, Adorno indulges in a polemical attack on the new left, which he dismisses repeatedly as a pathetic caricature of real political resistance. He insists on the importance of rational, theoretically informed practi practice and measures the new left by that standard. This text rejects his earlier assumption in the manifesto dialogue that the unity of theory and practice is desirable and necessary. Now, faced with an actual practical movement, Adorno discovers the virtues of their separation. Marcuse was predisposed to a more positive evaluation of this historical experience than Adorno. In earlier writings, he had praised the 20th century avant-garde's for attempting to overcome the separation of art and life. He interpreted this as a salutary challenge to the affirmative culture of the 19th century. The much overrated religion of art called forth the mockery of data and the cadavre exqui of surrealism. When the new left emerged, Marcuse interpreted it on the model of the early avant-garde's as an attempt to realize the imagination and reality. Although Adorno was at first sympathetic, he soon, he soon came to the conclusion that the movement was simply a scene on which the pseudo-activity of a psychologically damaged youth played itself out. And certainly the narcissism and reification Adorno complained of were manifest in many aspects of the new left. He was not entirely wrong to argue that the society had corrupted its adversaries. Marcuse was far from uncritical and constantly insisted that the new left base its actions on theory and solidarity rather than wishful thinking and impulse. But he did so in dialogue with the new left and not as a hostile critic. On the whole, he considered the new left as a popular breakthrough to a critical relation to advanced capitalism. Critique was historical once again, no longer only philosophical and artistic. What impressed him most were manifestations of solidarity and the rejection of consumerism, the principal glue holding the one-dimensional society together. 
Marcuse recognized what we now accept as a commonplace, namely, that despite its flaws, the new left redefined the possibilities and goals of the opposition to advanced capitalism. It introduced a new form of radicalism freed from vanguardism and workerism. In Marcuse's thought, this conclusion was associated with a quasi-Hegelian teleology, reinterpreted non-dogmatically. Freedom is not the necessary outcome of history, but when struggles for freedom do occur, they can be recognized as contributing to a possible destiny humanity may yet fulfill. Marcuse's interpretation of the new left depends on a theory of experience that has a certain similarity to Lucas's theory of consciousness. Recall that in history and class consciousness, the proletariat is able to transcend its reduction to commodity because of the gap it recognizes between its reified form as wage labor and the concrete life conditions that depend on the rate of wages. The mismatch between these two determinations, the one stemming from the commodity form and the other from concrete experience, gives rise to an original practical mediation that is the basis of the revolutionary movement and of Marx's dialectical method as well. Marcuse argued that the new left was rooted in a radical form of experience that mediates the reified, one-dimensional reality of capitalism. That mediation results from the recognition of the unrealized technical potential of the production system, chained by capitalism to waste and war when it could easily supply all the needs of the population. Poverty and the competitive struggle for existence are now technologically obsolete. Recognition of this gap between the potential and the existing reality, like that which Lucas identified in the case of the proletariat, is not merely a matter of opinion, but, Marcuse claims, has the force of a somatic necessity for the youthful revolutionaries. Marcuse offers revealing examples of such recognition and argues that it corresponds to a generalized aesthetic sensibility that finds beauty in the affirmation and flourishing of life. He explains that this new sensibility achieves a partial, partial desublimation of libido and a redeployment of erotic energy beyond the bounds of sexuality as a generalized aesthetic relation to reality. The new sensibility promises to rejoin reason with life and a new science and technology. It overcomes the restrictions Horkheimer and Adorno believe block access to an experience of potentiality. This would be the realization of the Frankfurt School's dream of a truly enlightened reason able to reflect on itself and to motivate solidarity with humanity and nature. I will have more to say about these radical ideas in the next chapter.